This is Mary Elner Storms, and this is Bryn Mawr College. And I'm making a video because we've got lots of new equipment in the labs, that, which is really exciting. Um, so although there are videos on the website about using what is called a rotary evaporator, it was actually the first video we ever made. Um, we now have a different kind of rotary evaporator, which I'll explain to you. And I'm going to show you how to use it. But it's, it's valuable to look at any video, even our old video on rotary evaporation. Um, to get started, I just want to compare rotary evaporation to distillation. In lecture, you will be learning, in the first weeks of lab, you will be learning about, about distillation. And what distillation is, is whenever you take a um, volatile substance and you vaporize it and then you recondense it. And you do this for the purposes of separation, or, what, or another way to say that is purification, okay? What I want to point out is that in any still or distillation apparatus, there is a heater, there is a pot. That is where the liquid is heated from, okay? This is a little more elaborate than normal, but there's usually a thermometer. Then there's a condenser where the vapors cool and then there's something to collect them in over here. And I want you to note that because a rotary evaporator is very similar. Okay, so we're going to go over to a rotary evaporator. You'll see in our lab we have many rotary evaporators. Um, this is our kind of new style rotary evaporator. So the type of rotary evaporator that's in the um, first video that you might have looked at is what's called a cold water condensed rotary evaporator. This can be used either with ice, I have ice in it right now, or dry ice. So we can go to very low temperatures, okay? Um, how do you work the rotary, or let, let's make the comparison. So the comparison is, this is the heater, but it's, it only goes up to very low temperatures. This is gonna be the pot, and I have a liquid in the pot. This is the condenser, and again, in lab, this will typically be filled with dry ice and acetone, which is at minus 78 degrees. And it's, it's like an inner chamber. It, it doesn't come in contact with the, the actual chemicals don't come in contact with the gas. The gas is on the outside. Then there's a receiver. Now, one thing that's very different is you'll notice there's no thermometer. And you're gonna notice we're gonna put this at reduced pressure, okay? So what are the problems with distillation? The problems with conventional distillation is that you typically have to heat the liquid to a very high temperature to get it to vaporize and then condense. When you heat things to very high temperature, what happens is you get decomposition of the compound. Sometimes you form peroxides, and peroxides, when they become dry, can explode. It's also very slow. Anyone who has ever distilled knows how slow it is, and you will know, because you will have all this time for contemplation the first couple weeks when you do like conventional distillation. So how do you speed it up, and why do you speed it up, and when do you speed it up? Well, the rotary evaporator is an auto, sort of like an automatic solvent removal system. So when you use a rotor, why would you use a rotary evaporator as opposed to a distillation? You'd use a distillation if you wanted to separate, say, two liquids that had close boiling points, and you had to closely monitor it with a thermometer. Or you'd use a distillation if you had a very volatile liquid and a very stable, non-volatile solid you were trying to separate it from, for example. But when do you use this? You use this typically when you're interested in isolating a solid or a very high boiling liquid that is dissolved in some solvent, and you just want to get rid of all the solvent very, very rapidly. Okay, so what do you do? You put it on the rotary evaporator. So now I'm going to go how, how you do it, and then I'm going to explain how it works. So the way these work, is that they have a pump. And when you come into the lab, the pump will be on. Do not start operating these without discussing it with your instructor or TA. So if it appears to be off, get someone to help you, okay? Notice I am fully geared up, goggles, gloves, lab coat, you guys will wear an apron. Why am I geared up like this? Why am I dressed like this? Because I'm working with chemicals and because this is gonna be at reduced pressure and Apparatuses that are reduced pressures can implode, okay? It is a possibility. It's very unlikely, but it can happen. So these have a pump. The pump is going to reduce the pressure in the distillation system. This is a big difference between the still you'll use the first couple weeks and the still. 
This is a stealth too, it's a type of stealth. So all you have to do when you come in is you just push the start button that's at the top. So again, the pump will already be on. What's happening here? The pressure is going down, okay? So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take my sample, and by the way, when we're talking about rotary evaporation, full is half full. You never want this more than half full. I'm a little bit less than half full. This has an organic solid dissolved in some acetone. It's just for demonstration purposes. Okay, what am I gonna do with this? Um, of course, I have my clip. I'm gonna grab a clip, hold on. Okay, so our, our videos are very cash. Okay, so what am I doing? I'm taking my round bottom that has the liquid in it, and I want to get rid of the acetone and get the organic solid. Then I'm putting the clip on. The clip is just for safety. Okay, the clip, technically, because this is at reduced pressure, all of these pieces would stay on if because of the vacuum, but sometimes the vacuum fails. So think about a vacuum sucking it would hold the glass on, but if the vacuum got weak, the flask could fall off. If the flask fell off, the sample would go into the bath, the water would go into the sample, okay? Now, to get things going, you have to, this stop cock will normally be in a down position when you get on. Don't play with this, okay? This is the stop cock you'll turn. I'm gonna turn this 90 degrees, Okay, 90 degrees on a 360 degree clock. Okay, 90 degrees. When I do that, I have closed it off to the atmosphere. When it's like this, you'll hear a hissing sound. It's sucking air in, and if the pressure isn't very low. When I close this, the pressure's gonna pump way down, okay? So the pressure's going down. Right now, it's at 340 or 20 millibars, and the goal is 29 millibars. At 29 millibars, we will be significantly below atmospheric pressure, and it'll change the distillation. It's coming down now. It's now it's at 116, 112, and so forth. Okay, it's coming down. I would say when you get below 100 millibars, you can probably start working. Okay? So what do I want to do? What I want to do is start my sample rotating. So I turn this knob. Ooh, and you can see it bumped a little bit, which is kind of exciting. I don't know if you saw that. Okay, so you start this rotating, okay, and it's already distilling, all right? So what happened there? Partially because I was talking too long, I talked excessively, I let this sit too long before I started rotating, all right? But let's talk about what's going on here. One thing that's going on is it's at reduced pressure, okay? What happens at reduced pressure? At reduced pressure, the atmosphere, which weighs heavily down on the sample, is, is, is much, much less. There's much less pressure on the molecules in the sample. When there's less pressure on the sample, the molecules, and think of the atmosphere, it just, just consists of molecules. So if it's 760 torr and it's weighing down on your sample, it's harder for the molecules to lift off and become vapor, right? So you reduce the pressure. When you reduce the pressure, there's far fewer molecules weighing down on the sample. This means the molecules become much more volatile and they lift off at a much higher rate. So that means you can distill or you can vaporize at a much lower temperature. Why is that a good thing? That's a good thing because we just said heat isn't good. Heat causes decomposition, heat causes the formation of peroxides. Okay, heat is not a great thing. Also, it just takes a long time. So what happened here, because it had been sitting for a little while, I turned the rotor on and it started, the liquid started spinning around the surface and it just suddenly gave off a whole bunch of vapor at once and it bumped a little bit into this um, trap. The trap is there to keep us out of trouble, okay? So what's the rotation for? The rotation increases the surface area and it causes the vapor to even lift off at a higher rate. And so the idea is it's becoming a vapor, it's going through this tube, it's coming up here, it's hitting this cold finger that's filled with either dry ice or water ice, and then it's dripping in. Now initially we had a little drip. But what's happened here, because um, 
evaporation is endothermic is that this has actually gotten very cold. There's actually ice on this lamb bar. So I need to warm it just a little bit. So how do we warm it? We're going to use this lever, okay, it's kind of like a jack, and I'm going to lower the sample into the water, and I don't know if you can focus in on that, but lower the sample into the water to warm it a little bit. What you'll start to see is the liquid should start dripping off this condenser, and I don't know if you can see that with the video, but there's actually liquid dripping off. What is that? That is acetone. Acetone boils at atmospheric pressure at 66 degrees or so. In this, at this very reduced pressure, it's, got, it's distilling at like, I have it at 39 degrees, and it's distilling at a pretty good rate, and I don't even have dry ice. Now you might wonder again, why did we switch, if you, if you watch the other video, why did we switch to this kind of apparatus? Because it's better for the environment. Particularly when we have dry ice in here, we collect all the liquid. There's no liquid like escaping out into Bryn Mawr. Um, also, we have better control over the pressure, um, and we get um, a much more rapid distillation. Okay, so what, what I'm doing right now is I'm distilling acetone off. What is my goal? My goal is to get rid of all the acetone and have left the organic compound that I dissolved in the acetone, which happens to be uh, seven methyl. 7-methyl uh, umbiliferum. I'm sorry, 4-methyl um, umbiliferum. I just picked it. It was around, and I put it in. It's not particularly reactive. So it's in here. What's my goal? My goal is to get rid of all the acetone. So what you do is, as you're doing this, you check it every once in a while, and there's still liquid in there, but I'm starting to see white solid deposit on the glass. All the vapor is leaving, the solid is staying behind. This would not work for two liquids that had close boiling points. If you had two liquids like cyclohexane and toluene, they would both vaporize and distill over. And notice you have no thermometer to keep track of what's coming off. So this is, only works when you have something that's very low boiling with something that's a solid or very high boiling liquid. And the goal is to get what's in the pot and get it dry. And why is it that I can go to dryness? Because I'm not heating it very much. If I'm not heating it very much, I'm not going to form peroxides, or it's very, very unlikely. So an explosion is very unlikely. Now this has been going a little longer, and you can see almost all the solid is gone, or almost all the liquid is gone. It looks like a solid shell. That's the umbiliferum, the 4-methyl umbiliferum. That is it, okay? Like if you had sodium chloride in water, you could distill off the water, you'd have the salt left there. Can you use this again? Yes. This is a good way also if you want to just collect solids and recycle them. And again, you're going to see when we use dry ice, very good for the environment because what's happening is the liquids are getting all collected here and there's no way for them to really escape into the atmosphere. We used to use what was called an aspirator. The aspirator was open to the atmosphere and the gases got out. So this is much better. And we have eight of these. So you'll feel like you have your own. All right, so this is done, I think. How do I know it's done? It looks really dry. So what I'm going to do is take it off. How do I take it off? I lifted it out of the water. If it's in the water, lift it out. You have to squeeze this lever to lift it out. And some people have trouble with this. If you have trouble, just ask for help. Then I turn the rotor off and stop it. And again, it should look like a solid shell when you're done. We're going to use these a lot. <laughs> and then what you do is you take the clip off. A lot of times people have trouble with clips. You've got to hold the ends of the clips with your finger and just pull it like that. Okay, so it's off. Now, I'm holding on to this because I don't know if it's going to stay on. What do I have to do to get it off? I have to vent it. The way I vent it is I open the stop top, and then I'm going to turn the pump off, OK? Just hit the stop button on the pump. You can hear this hissing sound because it's sucking air in and coming back to atmospheric pressure. How do I get the sample off? I hold on to the top piece and give it a little jiggle and it'll come off and your sample will be in here. And if you tear at the flask, you will, you'll be able to figure out what the weight is. A lot of times you have to kind of scrape this off. Now I just want to show you this bumping thing again. There's one more thing. I'm going to put a little more acetone in here. I just want to show you. Okay. I'm going 
going to be a little rough on it again. You'll notice there's a lot of material deposited up in this um, trap. This is a trap. And this trap, the compound, I could get this compound out if I want to. I could just take this off, rinse it with acetone, and I could recover it. Okay? Why did I get that bumping action? Because I kind of started it up a little rough. All right, so I'm going to start it again. So I, I just turned the pump on, okay? Putting the sample on, clip it. The fat part of the clip goes on the bottom. The thinner part goes on the, the neck of the, this uh, adapter. Okay, now let's see what it does. So I'm going to turn it up. All right, it didn't do it. It didn't bump that time. That's the way it's supposed to start. Um, if I had been, occasionally what happens is you just get a large formation of bubbles all at once and it pushes the liquid up. That's what happened earlier. And the liquid actually shot up into this trap. And that saved us because all the compound got caught in the trap. I don't know if that makes any sense. But the trap is here because with this kind of system with the very low pressure, and the dry ice, it bumps every once in a while. And bumping is just like a rapid expansion of gas. It happens to you in the kitchen. Like if, you if you're if you making, I'll probably have to do it now because I've been abusing it. But if you sometimes when people have a mug and they put hot water in it and there's no like little grooves in the mug for bubbles to form on, they put that mug in and they overheat the water and then they take it out and they just get a giant bubble forming in the bottom of their mug of coffee and it just goes flying all over the place. That's one of the dangers of a microwave. That's what happened here. What happened here was I just suddenly, I have a very smooth sur surface, had a sudden huge bubble formation. All the liquid shot up in here and a lot of the compound got trapped in here, but I have a trap. If I didn't have the trap, what would happen? It would just shoot over. So let's see if it does it. Maybe if I put it down in the heat. I, now I let it sit for a long time. That didn't bump. It doesn't want to bump anymore. But that's what the trap's for. And you saw it happen in the beginning. And you can just rinse that liquid right back down in the pot. OK, so I'm going to take it off one more time so you can see it one more time. So I'm going to let this come down to dryness. You can rotate this very rapidly. All I did was add more acetone to it. I'm removing the acetone right now. I could show you how to recover that, but I'm not going to today. Still at 39. Oh, I'm not. I'm not under. I didn't turn turn this off. I didn't close it. That's why I didn't bump. But I can tell you one of the things that will help you with bumping is just getting it rotating right away. So I didn't have this closed. Let me do that again. This is not my best. Okay. So how do you start? Let's just do it again. Hit the button. Hit the start button. Close this. I didn't do that. Turn this up. It didn't bump, thankfully. If you do it quickly, it doesn't usually bump. Sometimes when it's too full, it does that. Lower into the liquid. I'm going to let it go to dryness. So it's start, close, lower it in. It's coming down to dryness. It's distilling now. You can see it distilling again. It's like you're seeing the whole thing over again if it didn't make sense. Maybe it makes less sense now. I don't know. Okay. Now I'm gonna, it's dry, so we're rotating that into dryness. Okay. What do I do? Lift it out of the water. You gotta squeeze this. Lift it. It feels like a jack. You close this. You turn this off. Stop it from rotating. I'm kind of an advocate of venting it for a second. Then hit the stop button, because then it kind of comes down. It's starting to come down to atmospheric, and, and it's not sudden. Sudden. Then what do you do? You take the clip off gently, you give it a little jiggle, and it comes off like that. Okay, I hope that made some sense. And the machine will be set up. Don't turn anything on or off except the pump. Okay? Thanks a lot. That's the end.